You're watching Economics Amplified, the latest thinking on the biggest issues from U Chicago's Becker Friedman Institute. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Steve Levitt, and uh, I run the center that was formerly known as the Becker Center, which is now part of the Becker Friedman Institute. I don't know what we're called now, the price theory something or other. Um, and uh, it's always a pleasure to have the chance to uh, bring some of our uh, most interesting and original faculty uh, in front of you to, to show you what they're working on. I met Emily Oster, our speaker today, probably probably more than a decade ago uh, when she was a graduate student at Harvard. And I was immediately uh, taken with Emily because uh, she's one of the few economists who studies things that are even more um, scattered and bizarre than, than I myself study. So among Emily's various topics she's taken on are witches and um, menstrual cups, which I'm not even going to go into that, um, hepatitis. Uh, she's got a book coming out on uh, a thinking woman's guide to pregnancy. And today she's going to talk about something completely and totally different from any of that. But anyway, uh, it's great to have her here. Come on up, Emily. All right, so uh, so thank you, Steve. Um, and it's a real uh, pleasure to be here. As Steve said, I'm going to tell you guys today uh, a little bit about some stuff I've been uh, working on about health information, uh, demand for health information, use of that information in the context of Huntington's disease. Um, and I'll talk for maybe 35, 40 minutes, and then I'm happy to take questions about menstrual cups or other topics that you might be interested in. OK, so the the sort of policy, the broad motivation here that is is that over time, over the last decade, last 15 years, last 50 years even, our information, our access to information about our health has really improved, really increased. There's been just a huge growth in the availability of, of testing. So some of this comes in the form of better diagnostic tests like prenatal testing or cancer screening. And some of it comes in the form of increased access to genetic testing. Those tests tend to not be diagnostic, but rather to be predictive. So this would be something like the BRCA marker for breast cancer or the APOE4 marker for Alzheimer's. And if you kind of look at the news, you get the impression that more of these are being discovered all the time. And I think that there are many questions we could ask about this, but sort of the two key questions that I'm going to think about in this research are one, you know, to what extent do people actually want this information? Um, is it a good idea to encourage them or even you know, force them in some way to get, to get this kind of information? Uh, and the second thing is once people have this information, what, what will they do with it? So to what extent do we expect behaviors to change as people learn this, these pieces of information about their disease risk. One kind of behavior you might wonder about them changing is health behaviors. To what extent will people uh, change how healthily they behave in general? But you may also ask questions like, and that's a lot of what we'll focus on today, like will people get less education if they know they're going to die sooner? Or will they get more education if they know they're going to live a long time? So I'm going to think about sort of versions, parts of both of these questions in the particular context. So the context we're going to think about is Huntington's disease. Huntington's is a degenerative neurological disorder. Uh, the onset of the disease is early adulthood, typically sometime between 30 and 50, although as you'll see uh, from some of the data that I show you, actually onset age varies widely. Some people have onset as early as their teens, some not until they're quite a bit older, uh, older than this. Uh, it's a really devastating disease. It's, it's a motor disease, so there's degeneration in both physical abilities and mental abilities. Uh, death typically occurs sort of 15 to 20 years after onset, and typically as a result of some kind of uh, pneumonia or some kind of like nursing home acquired infection. Uh, there's no cure, there's no significant treatment. It is a genetic disease. Uh, it has very simple genetics, which is part of what's going to be important. Here. So the disease is what we call autosomal dominant, which means if one of your parents has it, you have a 50-50 chance of getting it. If you have the gene, the marker, the genetic marker for the disease, you get it for sure unless you die early from something else. So that is distinct from something like BRCA, which increases your risk but isn't 
fully predictive cure, it, it's fully predictive everybody with this mutation will develop the disease. There is a perfectly predictive genetic test for this. So it's not surprising that probably no one in the room has had this, but if you have one parent with this, so you have a 50% risk, uh, you might think about getting this test, which would tell you for sure if you were going to be healthy or if you were going to get the disease. So uh, we're going to ask a bunch of questions. I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the demand for this test. You, are people interested? People in the risk group, are they interested in this test? If they're not, uh, why not? Uh, would it be better if we encourage them to get tested? Is that something that, that would be valuable uh, or or perhaps it's just not at all valuable. Uh, and then second, we'll think a little bit about reactions to this information, in particular about a theory uh, called human capital theory, which would predict that people who are in this sort of disease group would get less education, less job training, and we'll think about, uh, think about testing, that, testing that here. OK, so let's start with the demand for testing. And so what I want to do here is I basically want to start by giving you some facts about testing in this population. So these facts are going to be based on a data set that I've been using along with a bunch of neurologists. So I don't want to give you all of the incredibly mundane details of the data, but just to give you a little bit of a sense. Uh, in this data set, we have about 1,000 people. Everyone has one parent who has Huntington's. And at the time that they enrolled in the study, they were untested. So they, and in principle, they didn't have any symptoms. So they were basically at 50% risk of, of having the disease. They're then followed over time, and we see them about once a year, and we learn information about them, information about their disease progression, uh, information about some of their kind of life choices and behaviors, and some of them choose to get tested, and we learn about their, their testing, whether they get tested, and what something about what the result is typically. Okay, so based on this data, uh, let me show you a bunch of facts. The first fact, uh, which I'll just tell you, is that demand for testing is low. So in, our, in this population, uh, over the course of the decade that we see people, about 5% of people undergo what we call predictive testing, which is to say they test as a, in an attempt to get some information about their disease state. Okay? That number is very consistent with what you see in other populations. Uh, basically about five, something between five and 10% of, uh, of people who are at risk for this get some kind of testing. Now I think it perhaps is not, whether or not you think this number is low, like lower than you would think, it sort of depends on your theory and that's what we'll get into later. I think that, you know, you might have expected that it would, ne it would not be 100%, like we're never going to have everybody wanting to do something, but I think that this number strikes me and I think a lot of other people as quite, uh, as, as kind of quite limited. It's much less than you would see, for example, in, in bracket testing. Uh, testing is also relatively inexpensive. So lest you think that the, that the reason testing is low is that it costs $50,000, actually it's, it's not very expensive. Uh, it's a couple hundred dollars in lab costs. It would typically be covered by insurance and uh, sort of further kind of suggesting that, that money is just not the concern. In places like Canada, where not only is this covered by insurance, but there's really no risk of like losing your health insurance if you find out you have this, you see testing rates that are very similar. Okay, okay so those are just sort of simple facts. Now let me show you a few like results that we have from these from these guys. So the, the first result I'm going to show you is that is that testing is increasing in ex ante risk of a positive result. What that means is that in this data, the people who are most likely to be tested appear to be the people for whom the expectation that the result is positive, that they get the bad result, that they have the disease, is highest. Okay, so the way that we can, we can test this, the way I can show you this, uh, is we look at people, we see people at many different visits. At each visit, they're evaluated by a doctor, and the doctor gives us a sense of whether they think this person has Huntington's or not. So in, what they do is they actually rank them on a scale from zero to four, where zero means this person has no symptoms. One means, well, it looks like maybe they could have some symptoms, it's hard to tell, and then going up to four, which is like, definitely, I'm sure this person has the disease. The reason why this is, this is a relevant distinction in this particular disease is that the onset is quite slow. 
So you can sort of start showing some symptoms, which could be Huntington's, or they could just be you know, getting older, or they could just be like you had a bad day. And then eventually, you get to more and more sort of distinctive symptoms. And so what we can do is we can look at the relationship between this doctor evaluation and individual subsequent choice to be tested. So we basically ask the question, for people in each of these categories, no symptoms, a little bit, maybe a little more, I'm sure that they have it, what is the chance that before the next visit, they get tested? So that's what we see in this graph. So on the x-axis here, I have you know, no, no symptoms. And remember, these people are still, you know, they're still at risk. I mean, this is a population with a 50% risk. But at this point, there's no evidence that they have the disease. And then we kind of get all the way up to the people who the doctor says, I'm sure greater than 99% chance this person has, has Huntington's. Uh, and you can see that, in fact, the group that is most likely to be tested, something like 5% of them test before the next visit, are the people who the doctor says, I'm really pretty sure that this person has it. Um, and you can see it's sort of increasing over this whole, pretty much this whole range. And you can look at this in a couple of other sort of related ways, and you see very similar things. That basically, in some sense, the people who are most likely to find out bad news are nevertheless the most likely to seek out that news. OK, fourth thing. People who are untested are wildly overly optimistic about their risk. So the way we're going to measure this is we're going to construct for each individual the actual risk that they should assign to themselves based on their current level of symptoms. So in addition to this doctor evaluation, we actually also have quite detailed information about a series of tests that the doctor performs that evaluate your level of motor symptoms. Okay, so these tests are things like when someone comes in the door, how quickly do you look over to see them? Okay, so it turns out delay in that reaction, that's a symptom of Huntington's. That's something that is more common among people with Huntington's than people without. Although, like many of these tests, sometimes it just takes you a little while to look over at the door. And you know, mo many people in this room would receive a score of something like one or three on this test. The scores go up to 150. Okay, so what we do, is we use the data that we have to assign what's called a posterior, like a Bayesian posterior, to each individual, which just says, given the level of symptoms that I see, what's the sort of true chance that you have Huntington's? And so for someone with a score of like one or zero on this test, in this population, the chance is about 50-50, it's just their baseline risk. As you get up to a score of 20, 25, 30, you're, you're basically sure, we, we are sure that you have it, even if you are not. We then match that to people's own reports of their risk. So we're, we ask people at every visit, what is the chance on a score scale from 0 to 100, what do you think is the probability you carry the Huntington's mutation? And they report some number, like 30, 40, 70, something like that. And so we just match those up, and we ask, basically, do, are people kind of about right on their, uh, on their risks? Are they too high? Or are they too low? So on the x-axis here, we have this motor score. Uh, on the y-axis, we have a measure, so we have the probabilities. The dotted line on the top shows you the evolution of the true posterior in the data. So you can see basically down here at a motor score of one or two, you don't really get much information. Those people are basically just kind of like, they have a 50-50 risk. But as you get to up here, people with a motor score of 20, 25, something like that, those guys basically all have, have the disease. Another way to say that is just very, very rare to, to get a score that high and not have Huntington's. But when we look at people's beliefs, they're moving, but like not a lot. So basically, people with no symptoms tell us their risk is about 40% on average. People with symptoms where, the, where like they should be sure, and for almost all these people, the doctor says, I'm sure that this person has it. They don't tell them, but they tell, they tell us as the researchers. Those guys are still reporting their risk as about 50-50. They're just like, it, they're moving, it goes up a little bit, but it's kind of way overly optimistic. And you can see, the, these are the interquartile ranges. You can see that actually, like, basically, even the 75th percentile of the, of the distribution is not kind of getting this right. OK, so, so last fact um, has to do with, with behavior. So in this data, I'll talk more in this sort of second paper, we do much more with behavior. But in this data, 
we see a little bit of information about people's behavior. We ask them at each visit, did the following thing happen to you in the last year? And these things are like, did you get divorced? Did you borrow a lot of money? Did you retire? Did you, um, sorry, did you have a baby? Um, and so we can look at whether be, the sort of incidence of those behaviors varies with the disease. So one theory you might have for why testing doesn't occur at a high rate is that there's nothing that these guys are gonna do in response to the test. And it's true in this particular setting that there's very little like you can do to improve your health. And so this is one way to test, look, do you see differences in behavior for people who know that they carry the mutation and know that they don't? In the data, because we have some people who are tested, we have some people who know they carry the mutation, some people who know that they don't. And we can see whether their behaviors are differ, different, and then we can compare that to people who are in this uncertain group. We can ask, are those guys behaving in some intermediate way, right? So our theory would be like, if, if you want to so think about it, retirement's a good example. Let's imagine if you, if you know you're gonna die really early, you wanna retire early so you can experience the retirement. The, you, know, you can travel. And so what we would expect there is we'd expect to see people who are sure that they're gonna die early, they, travel, they retire early. People who are sure that they're not retire at, like, later. And we would think that then if you have like a 50% risk of dying early, perhaps you would be in somewhere in the, in the middle of that. You behave in some intermediate way. Right? That's at least what like, a very simple model of behavior would predict. In fact, what we see, and these are the sort of five of these behaviors on which we see some differences. These bars are, are graphed relative to people who know that they do not carry the mutation. The black bars <coughs> represent people who know that they do carry the mutation. And so you can see those are, those are quite different from zero and they have little <coughs> marks on the top to indicate statistical significance. So we can see that, that on, at least on these dimensions, pregnancy, divorce, retirement, something called financial changes, um, changes in recreation, we see that there's actually quite large differences in behavior between people who know they carry the mutation and know that they don't, suggesting that this information is valuable, that you would make different choices if you have the information than if you don't. But the uncertain group, these lighter bars, the people, and this, this includes everybody who's uncertain, kind of no matter what their level of risk, virtually all of these guys are behaving exactly like the people who do not have the mutation. So not only are they, another way to put this is not only are they, are they expressing these overly optimistic beliefs that we saw in the previous graph, but they're basically acting like those beliefs also. They're sort of acting in a way that is consistent with what would be optimal to do if they were healthy. And you can see in tables in the paper, which I'm not gonna show you, that actually even people who have very high risk, even within this uncertain group, people who are already pretty sick, still continue to behave like the guys who are healthy. Okay, so, so these, I think these facts are interesting. This like helps us think uh, about the problem, but the, the reason to, to kind of outline these facts or to go back to the original, to what I think is like the, the interesting question, at least for economists here, which is, okay, thanks Paul, uh, which is why are people resistant to testing? So why are these testing rates so low? That idea is basically, this, this low rates of testing are, are basically inconsistent with some, at least some you know, standard economic models, which would say that information is valuable. So if you look at sort of basic utility theory, tells you that you want more information, more information is better than, than less. Uh, I also think that this has some relevance for policy uh, when we think about sort of how we provide people with information. And in particular, especially on the policy side, I like to kind of separate these two classes of explanations. So there'd be one class of explanations for low testing rates, which would say it, that people really want testing, but there's some like barrier to doing that. So it could be cost, uh, it could be that it's really hard to get the testing, or it could be just that they procrastinate, that actually people would like to get this test, but the, they just can't get themselves together to, to do it, which, you know, which maybe in Huntington's is not so, so relevant, but certainly that's a story people would tell you about cancer screening. Like the reason people don't want to get screened for cancer is not that they don't want to, it's just that like, it's like a lot of work, you go to the doctor, it's hard, you find it, et cetera. A second class of explanations would be actually that people literally just don't want this test. That you would actually make them less happy if they knew the truth. 
Okay, and, and in that case, of course, you definitely don't want to encourage testing or you may not want to encourage testing. And the role of the facts that I've presented here is to try to discipline the model. Right, to try to discipline kind of what's the model of, of behavior that we think actually explains this low rate of testing. So I'm actually going to tell you a little bit about what I think is the right model, not with math, just with words, uh, and then you can kind of think about it for yourself. So, so the theory, I think, is, is fitting these facts well, is one which has the following features. People value anticipation. It is actually not true in standard models. The idea would be that when I think about the future, if I think the future is going to be good, that makes me happy. And if I think the future is not going to be good, that makes me upset. So that seems like a kind of a, you know, economists don't generally value like personal intuition as uh, a model testing tool, but I think that this works on that, on that criteria. In this case, if you are untested, you can just decide to believe whatever you want. And that's kind of the key, that's kind of the key to this model is that for, for people who don't get, don't get tested, if, if you're uncertain, you can just decide, you know what? I'm just going to think that everything is fine. I'm going to live my life as if I'm healthy. And that's just the way, I, that's the way it is. If you do that, you have to then act like you're healthy. That's kind of part of believing, part of adopting these, like being overly optimistic is you have to act like it. And that may have long-term consequences if you turn out to have made the wrong choices later. Eventually, you, you find out the truth. And if you held the wrong beliefs, you will have made the wrong choices. So for example, if you decide to just pretend everything is fine and keep working and not retire early, it may turn out if you end up actually having the disease that you wish that you had not done that. And that's kind of costly for you later. But the flip side is that there's this like valuable anticipation period in which you got to live a lot of your life thinking kind of thinking everything would be fine and that's something you value. And the key result in this model, the sort of thing that I try to try to pull out in the paper is that actually in this model somebody who's like totally rational, a totally like rational utility maximizing actor that economists like may actually choose not to get this information because the cost of like not being able to pretend outweighs the benefits of uh, of getting to make these like appropriate retirement and financial choices later. This model turns out to have implications that exactly fit the data that we have. So it has the implication, in fact, is like built into the fabric of the model is the idea that people's beliefs are overly optimistic, that people act in accordance with those overly optimistic beliefs. It actually also predicts that the testing is an increase in risk because as your risk of actually being sick, your objective risk goes up, it becomes more and more costly to pretend, and you are more and more likely to want to tie your hands and force yourself to accept the truth so you can kind of move forward in the, in the optimal way. This turns out, it turns out it's actually quite hard to rationalize these facts with these other models. Okay. So in terms of, like, to, to sort of bring it back to practicality in terms of implications, uh, this basically suggests that these low rates of testing may be rational. Uh, and that in this particular context, encouraging people to get testing would make them worse off. And that's true, and I think this is kind of an interesting point. Even if what you saw after testing is that they behave differently, that actually doesn't mean you've made them better off because you've taken away this like pretending opportunity that was valuable to them before they were tested. OK. so. Um, so having thought a little bit about this, this demand for testing, we then got interested in the question of how people, learning more about how people react to getting tested. So I showed you some in that graph about behavior change. We saw a little bit of evidence that people might behave differently. Um, but the, the one of the places we're most interested in differences in behavior is in, uh, is in education and other uh, things in the human capital category. So, Human capital theory, uh, originally due to, among other people, uh, Gary Becker, who is on the faculty here in the 60s. Here's the idea. You are a machine. You, as a person, are like a machine. Uh, and the longer is your life expectancy, the more time you have for use of capital investment. So your attendance at booths, that's a capital investment into your person machine. And the longer you expect to live, the more time you expect to be enjoying the fruits of that capital investment, okay? 
this is actually quite important for economic theory. Uh, models which like link changes in countries' life expectancy to economic growth often do so through this mechanism. The idea is like if people have longer life expectancy, then they'll go to, go to school more, and then that will be good for economic growth. Um, but it is actually quite hard to test because there are many reasons why low education and low life expectancy go hand in hand. And many of those reasons have nothing to do with kind of this causal story that I'm telling. So certainly, if you looked across countries globally, I promise you would see that places with low life expectancy have low education, but you really wouldn't learn anything from that, except that like some places are poor. Okay, uh, And so we, we want to try to figure out like the answer to this in a way that gets around some of those problems. So what we're going to do in this, what I, I do here is basically say this is a way, this is a population which might let us get around that, around that issue. Huntington's limits your life expectancy. Obviously, we can't just compare people who have Huntington's to people who don't, because that has like some of the same flavor of problems as the cross-country comparison. Uh, but what we can do is we can look within the people who are at risk, people with one parent with the disease, and we can say, look, let's imagine we have a sample of those people who get tested. Some of them find out they're positive. Some find out they're negative. We can then look at the subsequent educational choices that they make. And perhaps we can learn something about the impact of information about a limited life expectancy on your, uh, on your educational choices. So we're going we're gonna to do that here. Uh, and so what we do is we just look at people. We say, look, there are some people in the sample who get tested for this disease in their 20s, basically before they've completed their education. Um, but they don't get sick until later. So we can be sort of sure that when they got the test, there was actually a lot of information revealed by the test, by whether they tested positive or negative. So what you see is when we look at like completion of a bachelor degree in this, in this population, uh, for people who test negative, like 65% of them complete a bachelor degree. For people who test positive, it's only like 35%. If you look at years of schooling, you see a kind of a similar disparity. Uh, and we do a bunch of robustness checks in the paper, like showing, which is like crucial for economists, like showing that older people who get tested, who are testing after they made their educational choices, they don't show any differences in, uh, in their completed education. And we don't see much evidence of differences in high school, which is something that happens before anybody here gets tested. You can also see, so, so the other thing that happens with Huntington's is that even among people who get sick eventually, they get sick at different times. And so you have some people who are getting the disease like quite early, say in their teens, and some who, do, who get it, say, in their early 20s. Um, and so what you'd expect to see if the disease was impacting your, your uh, choices about education is that basically people would sort of peel off the educational path that they're on as they learn that they are that there are going to be limited returns to that education. And that's actually something we can see here. So this black line is individuals who, uh, who have onset in their teens. And you can see they're actually similarly likely to complete high school, but then they, they are much less likely than everyone else to enroll in college. The green line, which is individuals who, uh, who have onset between 19 and 22, they kind of enter college at similar rates, but then they, they fall off at college completion. And this sort of slightly older onset group falls off just around the graduate degree period. We see some other things. So um, we see some evidence that that having like that learning you have the disease limits your investments in job training. It's another kind of human capital investment. Um, we also see some evidence that that learning that you have the disease increases your risk of smoking. And so this is actually part of a related theory. So the idea here is that uh, that. If you're going to die from Huntington's, there's no point in quitting smoking. You can only die one time, right? So if this is going to kill you, then like, please enjoy your cigarettes. I actually had like a great conversation with a very famous economist once who I, I was telling her about this, and she was like, "I know this is so really relevant to me because I know one day I'm going to be dying in a plane crash, and we're going to go down. And I'm going to just be thinking, I cannot believe I quit smoking. Like that was the worst decision, right? So is there this feeling like ah, like I love smoking? Okay, so um, so people uh, people are basically when if you find out that you carry this, you don't uh, you don't quit smoking. Okay, 
But we see some limited impacts on cancer to screening, which turn out to be harder to detect because that actually doesn't happen till later in life. OK, so final, final thing to say, and then I'll open it to questions. So once we sort of learn this, this kind of tells you, look, if you get a huge shock to your life expectancy, if like somebody tells you that instead of living to 85, you're going to live to like 55, that really impacts how much schooling you get. That's actually not a, a number itself that's that interesting, because that is not the kind of life expectancy changes we're talking about when we want to know, you know, is kind of improving life expectancy in Botswana going to impact people's educational choices there. When we think about improving life expectancy globally, it's not 30 years at a time, it's a few, it's a few years. So we'd like to have a way to scale this effect so we could actually make comments like what share of the cross-country differences in education are due to differences in life expectancy. Um, and so, so what we're going to do is estimate an elasticity. So I see many people from my micro class here. Um, I hope that in your head you already know where I'm going with this. But in case you've like forgotten because of competitive strategy and how it's just a waste, uh, <laughs> we're going to say percentage change in education for a percentage change in life year. Okay, so that's going to be the elasticity definition here. It's going to be like the elasticity of education with respect to life expectancy. Uh, and it, it turns out the elasticity is like one. I, I don't know, I kind of like, I thought that was surprising, but I guess now I've come to think almost all elasticities are basically one. <laughs> that basically says if you double somebody's uh, somebody's life expectancy, you double their educational choice, their educational attainment. And then we can use that and we can say things, we can make like more speculative claims like increases in life expectancy over the last 50 years in the US can account for like somewhere between 6 and 20% of increases in college completion or like 20% of cross country differences in education uh, could, be, or could be attributed to differences in life expectancy. And again, those are like, you know, quite speculative thing to say, but it's just, it's sort of like a, like a place to start. Okay, so, um, so health information, genetic information is, is kind of increasing a lot. Um, and I think there's an important set of, of questions about what that means, uh, what that means for our health choices in general. Um, the, you know, there is like demand for this information, although I think th that in some sense it may be more, more limited, in particular in the cases in like precisely the cases that it's most useful. And so, you know, you see a lot like these, these like recreational genetic testing sites get a lot of play. Like there's like 23andMe. Like everybody wants to know that they might, that they have the gene that some Danish people have that makes them smart. You know, like everybody's interested in, like interested in that kind of like neat tidbit. And, and part of that is because there's sort of no bad information contained in that. Like if you learn that you don't have that, that gene, like who cares? Actually, it turns out that's a totally useless marker anyway. Um, but in cases in which the, the information is actually like quite valuable, but also might be bad, I think that it's more reasonable to expect that we might see people sort of resisting, resisting that. And actually, may be the case that that's okay. Like we may not want to encourage that testing. Sometimes we may, sometimes we may not. Um, and you know, once we see see people getting this, it actually I think it's possible that it could sort of change people's investments in the future. Although there's sort of the flip side that that if the information is good, it may change their investments in a good way. So that kind of trades off against the, the bad way. OK, so that's all I have. I'm very happy to take questions about this or anything else. And I've been told you have to go to the microphones or else there will be some kind of devastating tragedy involving not being able to hear you. So yeah, you have to go to the microphone. Thank you, Professor Oyster. Since you were dealing with uh, viral uh, diseases also with hepatitis and HIV, uh, what do you believe from this study is relevant for those diseases? Because in those cases, uh, getting people tested may help yeah. prevent the epidemic. No, I think that's a great question. So I particularly have been thinking about this in the context of HIV because you actually see a lot of the same kind of testing resistance in, in that setting. So we see a lot of people um, not, uh, not wanting not wanting to get tested, especially in Africa. And you can think that it may be for some of the same reasons. Like until recently, access to, to antiretroviral was, was limited. Like it's not clear why you would get, you know, why you would get tested. You may just want to like pretend it's everything is fine. Um, you know, there there's sort of a flip side, which is that actually there, there's an externality. So since since it's a communicable disease, which is not like this, 
you may want to encourage people to get tested because you think if they get tested, then they will protect other people, and that's something you find valuable. And then you're left in the sort of case where you're weighing basically individual utility loss against like other people's utility gain when you're trying to think about what's the right thing to do. Further complicating that analysis is that I actually think it's totally unclear in the data that when people get tested, they actually engage in like more pro-social behavior. So we just like, we, we don't see much in the way of changes in behavior at all in response to, to information about your, your status. And so in that sense, you'd say like, well, like who, who cares? Like, you know, in some sense, that's like an, another important, that is another important input to, to that decision. And so I think this kind of suggests that, you, that universal testing may not be perfect, may not be like a great idea privately, although then you, again, you wanna weigh the social stuff. And same with something like hepatitis or like basically anything that's communicable has that feature. Yeah. I'm not gonna like not call on you, so you can you can like go to the microphone if you. <laughs> Thanks very much. That was a very. Did you hear me? Uh, that was a very interesting talk. I have two questions. The first one is about the first part of the paper. So actually show that actually people may be better off not knowing what is coming, even though it's based on some kind of irrationality. I wonder about the other side of the coin. So would it be possible that maybe people who didn't know um, about what is going to happen and they develop the disease in the end, that they may regret so much uh, the things that they didn't do um, uh, to, the, to an extent that it just offsets the benefit of ignorance in the beginning. That is to say, I'm, I'm asking if you are not only yeah. looking at one part of the story, so to speak, forgetting the other part of the story. Mm -hmm. uh, the other question is related to the second part of your talk uh, that deals with the elasticities and the, the effects that the life expectancy may have on the education. Now, I'm wondering if we can make inferences for policies uh, from, from this kind of setting uh, it seems to me that it makes a big difference whether the I'm cutting future that is distant or that is close to me. Yeah. So, uh, for instance, uh, in case that uh, I know that my expect that I'm in the beginning of my of, of my life, I am 15 maybe, and I know that my uh, my life expectancy is 50 years, and now it turns into 60, then I can easily imagine that it's not going to affect my my choices so much as if I am 35, and I'm expecting to live to, I don't know. Uh, 50, let's say again, and now it's, it's actually cut to 40 or, or prolonged, prolonged to 60. So that is to say, whether the life expectancy or whether the uh, life expectations about the immediate future are not more important uh, than the long term. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So the answer to the first one is um, is I, that's sort of built into the model. So so in the model, the kind of downside of having made the wrong choice is that it entails some utility loss later, um, and that should encapsulate like. You could imagine that encapsulating regret. So that basically the like like the, the utility loss of not having retired optimally includes the fact that you feel bad about not having done that. Um, and so and so that's not like explicitly put in in the way that I do it as a separate thing, but I think there's a sense in which it could um, it could matter and has the implication that like the bigger you think is the loss to having made the wrong choice, which could include this regret. The, the more likely you are to have to test and actually get the information and make the right and make the right choices. So in fact, in this in the data, you could you could imagine I think it's very likely that there's some heterogeneity across people. And one way to model that heterogeneity is to say that people kind of differ in how bad they're going to feel later if they don't uh, if they don't make the right choice. And that could be for a psychological reason in addition to being for some like real like real reason. Um, on the uh, on the life expectancy, yeah. So actually, the elasticity I quoted is in discounted is like education for discounted life years, where we like discount at some rate, and so that's going to naturally encode the idea that uh, that I care about kind of things that are right now uh, versus later more. Um, there's sort of a, a a related a vaguely related issue that. Um, uh, that you might wonder about, like, so a lot of the gains in life expectancy in the last, like, you know, 50 years, at least outside of Africa, have been about, like, gains later. Like, gains is sort of between 70 and 90 or something. Um, actually, part of what I think makes Huntington's in some ways a good case study uh, for, for that elasticity is that, uh, that actually in many of the gains in the Huntington's population, many of the differences are about this sort of period between, like, moving from having a life expectancy of 60, of 80 to 60. 
which is in some sense like mimicking some of the, the global changes, which I think is kind of a nice, a nice feature. Thanks for that. It was a very interesting uh, topic. So uh, initially, you mentioned that <coughs> comparing the rate of testing in Canada and US, the difference wasn't that much significant. Yeah. Uh, but because like when people <coughs> are tested positively and they lose the insurance, the cost is actually relatively huge, like in the orders of ten thousand dollars. So uh, we expect like there should be some difference, and if actually there isn't any difference, then we can use this to bound the actual, like this utility that people that get by knowing the information. So I wanted to know. Yeah, some that's interesting. So the differences are quite small. They're not zero. They're like maybe like 8% versus 5% or something. So they're not like, um, they're, they're really small. Um, I like the idea. We actually hadn't thought about the idea of, of using this to, to, bound, uh, to bound the value on that. Part of what makes it a little tricky is actually the biggest cost for people here is uh, disability. Is like basically you get disabled, and so you need a lot of long-term care. Um, but in the U.S., like it, in the end, especially for like for a lot of the population, that's going to be end up being covered by Medicaid anyway. So there's a sense in which like there's like a, actually like a generous public insurance plan which is covering this, uh, which is covering this for you. And so it's a little like tr tricky to value. <laughs> A topic which I don't really want to get into, but it's like a little bit tricky to value kind of how how much loss there is for for people in this in this space. There's actually also legislation now which says that you can't discriminate in health insurance based on this based on genetic conditions like this and other things. Like Hi. So, uh, have you considered the um, effect on knowing that you have the disease in order to shorten your life so that the disease evolves quicker? Than it should have because there are you know uh, there are some research that says that your beliefs about I don't know, right. may affect the yeah we haven't so I actually have I've thought about I think it's a really good question I have thought about it and I don't think we have a lot of data that 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 says one way or the other so they've done kind of studies like people do in Alzheimer's to say like if you keep yourself active which maybe would be more likely if you knew you had it like does that slow things down um, and I I don't think they find a lot of evidence that that is the that that is the case. Um, but you know, it, there is a uh, there is a movement in the Huntington's population to like encourage people to get tested and then like do everything that they can to try to like slow down the onset. Since we don't have any actual way to do that, I think it's like a little bit bit tricky. But there's certainly people who think that if you know, you, you will like be able to slow it down somehow with like natural remedies of various sorts, which I, I don't think is any evidence that those will. I'm happy to take questions about other things also. Sorry, I still have one on this yeah, topic. Yeah, yeah, no, please. Um, I was wondering to what extent the risk of getting a false positive might impact uh, people's willingness to get tested. I don't know what the, mm -hmm. the rate is on Huntington's yeah. disease, but on something like breast cancer, where the more often you get tested and the earlier you get tested, the greater likelihood there is for a false positive, and that may change, uh, you know, behavior, and you may, you know, get treatments that um, that may harm you so I was just wondering if that if that impacted yeah. your study at all um, I think that is not a major concern here uh, in the sense that that uh, the it's not like screening for cancer where you could like find something early stage that would go away like it's a um, and it's also not even like HIV testing you actually it's actually a genetic test you actually have to sequence people's DNA and count the count the repeats um, and so it's like you surely you could make a mistake but it, it would not typically be in the sort of false positive thing. And I actually think because the sort of information is so, um, it can be so bad, they actually often do the test twice to try to. So I think that's, I think that's actually a, a, a concern in many of these other settings, but probably not this one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so this is like the next thing I would like to work on. So Steve's question is if the test was noisy, if like it told you, some, like sort of told you the truth, but you could kind of, it, not always, uh, would people like it better? I th Yes, this model has that implication. So that actually people would prefer a test, which was literally, I took this test and then I just added some like randomness to it. So basically if you got a good, the thing that would be nice about that is you could you could add randomness such that like when you got a good result, 
you, you, you knew that you were healthy. And when you got a bad result, you knew like there was an increased chance, but not 100% that you were sick. And so we've been trying to say, yes, that, has an, that is an implication, which is kind of interesting. And, uh, and it's something that I'm, I'm trying to sort of figure out a good setting to test it in. I think Huntington's is not because of various things, but like an example would be something like prostate cancer screening where you could try to like use variation across people and their like risk to do this. So this is, a, yeah, so I think that's like a super interesting implication, which is in principle testable. Professor Oster, it sounded like for rational individuals, uh, the policy implications may be that they would not want to get tested. We would not want to force them to get tested. Yeah. But thinking about it from a broader perspective, uh, let's say for a subset of the population in which you have just one breadwinner, uh, the head of the household, mm -hmm. uh, if this person were to develop uh, the disease eventually and uh, pass away, this would be a negative shock for the family from which it may be hard to recover. Does that therefore have is there, is there an argument for different policy recommendations? I don't that? think so, because being knowing that you're going to get it earlier, I think that would have a, a more of an implication if you thought there was something they could do about it. So if it's something like HIV, where if you thought that like if you get tested, then we can treat you, and then you're not going to die, that like that would that would be one of the arguments to encourage people to do that. Uh, I think here there's like because these kind of your your prognosis is similar, no matter what happens, the, the like knowing that you're going to die sooner is probably not helpful to your family either. So I, I suspect that. Hi. Uh, in your data about how people seem to sy systemically um, be overly optimistic about their results, mm -hmm. I was wondering if uh, you had done any studies about, is that only in the US? Is there any cultural component to that? And Yeah, uh, so, so, these, um, so these data are mostly in the US. It's a little bit of stuff from Canada. It looks kind of similar there, although our data is much more limited. Um, and so I think, but like it would be very neat to think about it in, in cultural contexts, which are different from the US and Canada, um, at which we, is not in the data. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So the first part of your study, uh, I interpreted as the actual existence of ignorant bliss. Right. Um, looking forward, do you think that that can be applied to other areas? Probably one of the First one that came to mind was personal finances. Yeah. I have friends who really don't know how much money they have, but they think they have a lot of money, and they're probably happier for that. Yeah. So, so, the, uh, so the other place people have used, so, I, so when I, I do this paper, we, we actually, this model that I, I showed you is actually due to some other, like it's like a version of a model by some other guys. And the other like empirical application people have thought about for that is in, in personal finance, in particular in this question of like looking at your portfolio. The idea is like, I don't want to look at my, you know, if like, I don't want to look at my portfolio because if I don't, I can like, I think, just think, like pretend that it's great. And if I do, I have to know it's bad. And so, you know, if I like look at my portfolio in like 2007 and then like I don't look at it again until now, I can be like, ah, everything was fine. You know, there's like, there's no growth issue. Fine. If I spent all this time like looking at it in the, in the interim, I would be very upset. So yes. And I think it has exactly the same implications that like perhaps if I had looked at my portfolio in 2008, I would have been able to do something to stem some of the like devastating losses, but since I ignored it, like at least I got to experience the joy of thinking my money was growing as everyone crashed and burned around me. So yeah, so this is so that's exactly uh, it is exactly the right understanding of the model and and, and also an excellent application. So, yeah. Going back to the question of externalities, what if um, I'm curious a little bit about the prospects of having children? Like it looked from one of your graphs that people who test positively are more likely to get that pregnant. Yes. Yeah. And both in terms of like having children right. who are then going to lose a parent in childhood and also the 50 percent chance of passing that on. Right. So is that something you would think of as an externality? On yes. Um, yeah. No. So I find that I find the fertility results here uh, very puzzling. Um, and, you know, in this, in like other versions of this data where we've looked at this, we see sort of a similar thing. We certainly see that these guys seem to have the same, like there, there's no reduction in fertility. Um, and I, I think that, that there is sort of this externality idea. I think that people are trading that off against like, if you, the earlier you have kids, like the more time you'll get to spend with them if you're going to die early. And I think people are, are, optimistic, whether overly or not, I think it's hard to say, that there will be a cure. If you think about basically like, I I'm going to have a kid now, and like they're not going to get sick until they're 45. And so like by then, surely we will know how to fix this. And like, 
Whether or not that's overly optimistic, I don't know. Like, there's certainly research going on. There's no like lead. So, but the fertility results are very puzzling. I guess is what I would say. So about the fertility results, um, yeah. I remember reading something. Sorry, I remember reading something about how uh, in the very early onset of Huntington's, it can often cause uh, an increase in risky behavior sure. and sometimes psychosis. Uh, yes, so it, it can, although. Um, Although those tend to postdate, but but actually we can look at the at, we ask people when you when they're asked about these these um, when they're asked about these activities they're asked whether that was a positive or a negative thing to have happen, and so actually we we, we see like this fertility stuff it, you sort of see a similar thing if you limit to people who say that like this was like a good thing for them which is perhaps like uh, uh, rules out like ha, has some impact on the question of like whether it's just like I accidentally got pregnant because of some like crazy behavior. But I think that is an issue. Yeah. yeah I, I was also surprised by the fertility uh, statistic that you put up there. And I, I couldn't help but wonder if after people know they have Huntington's, uh, that they're similarly, similarly overly optimistic that they will not pass it on, just as you, as you showed before for yeah, those who are not tested. So they, they um, you know, when you ask people like facts about the disease, they they kind of know them. Like they understand that like if they have a fifty percent risk, there's a good, you know if they have it as fifty percent risk, they're good. they'll tell you that. Um, but whether they sort of understand that and kind of like a decision relevant thing, I think is not um, is not totally clear. I mean, of course, people have all the same kinds of like probability biases you see in other settings. Like if one sibling in the family has it and there's two siblings, they like think that then definitely the second one doesn't because like they don't understand that. You know how probabilities work. Doesn't, doesn't work um, like that. <laughs> and so I think there is probably probably some of that. Um, and I think you know, people again, it's also sort of like I just am not gonna like think about this. And I really like having kids is really important to me. And like, it's gonna kind of work out later. I, I don't know. How do you think people would have responded if you would have asked them before testing? If you test positive, what's your likelihood that you'll have children? I think they would have said it's very low. Uh -huh. um, and in, but like in. There are other examples in this context where, like, hypothetical questions about testing have proved to be very poor. So, so like, when they first developed this test, they asked people, are you going to want this? People in the risk group, like, 80% of people were like, yes, I'm definitely going to get the test. And then, like, subsequently, they're sort of, like, don't. But, yeah, no, I, I would suspect people would tell you that their behavior was, would be very different. But then, kind of, once the information is there, it's not, I don't know. Okay. I also find this result puzzling. I have, like, a great explanation for it. I find the same thing puzzling along with also what you said about people with AIDS not necessarily engaging in more pro-social behavior. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if those are kind of consistent about people just who are more likely to die or who know they're more likely to die just being less responsible and do people feel less of a responsibility to unborn children than children they already have? What do you think about that? Yeah, so I think in the HIV context, the comment I was making was about the, was about data from Africa. Um, and I suspect some of what is going on there is like in, in some sense uh, unrelated to this, which is that people, uh, people once they are tested for HIV, if they test positive and then you come back a couple years later and you ask them whether they are sick, they like don't, they say they're probably not. So there's kind of like uh, some like sort of incorrect updating about probabilities, which I think is related to this kind of not changing your, your behavior. There's like a some poor understanding of the disease, which is not going on here. Um, the question of whether people feel sort of more or less pro-social behavior to their like unborn future children versus I, I, it seems like psychologists should be you need the psychology faculty to address that. I don't I don't really I don't have a lot of good thoughts on that. So my question is about um, whether we should ban the test um, mm -hmm. if there's no if there's nothing you do in response to it. It seems that if you look at like average wealth accumulation, someone who does not know and kind of chooses to be blissfully ignorant, would accumulate more wealth than someone who does know, and thus engages in all these risky behaviors. Right. Um, would there be a, a aggregate benefit to not having the test at all? It's interesting. Um, I, I, I'm sure you could write down a model in which you would get an aggregate benefit, um, which you would then have to weigh against the cost of, like, we generally don't like to, against the cost of some people who would like to have this information. Right, so if you think the population contains like a few people who want the information and many people who don't, the ban obviously has a cost for the few people who do. Um, I think it does kind of have the implication you may want to discourage the test, although that may be like for private reasons in addition to, to social reasons. I actually think to some extent that that happens. There's like 
this is a place where like the US and Europe differ. So there's actually some push in like France to like try to force people in this risk group to get the test. Whereas here, I think we tend to be a little bit like more hands off about the decision. Um, I don't know. I, you know, I'm like very reluctant uh, as a like Chicago economist to suggest banning things. Um, but you know, I think there is a sense in which in which you're, you're kind of right, and I'm sure that you could write down a model in which it would actually be optimal to do so. I'll, I'll try an unrelated question. Okay, unrelated question. Um, so talking about changes in pro-social behavior with regards to AIDS testing, um, just based on your personal experience, do you think that the fact that, say, uh, somebody who knows they have HIV and then, and then negligently or, de or even deliberately transmits it to somebody else, that that can actually be charged as homicide in the United States? Does that actually, do you think that actually changes Where behaviors and how faculty? people assess? <laughs> um, do you think, do I think that changes people's incentives? Yeah, do you think, how do you think people weigh those I don't types have of a strong instinct on this. I will tell you my personal opinion, which is that I don't think that the kind of person who would do that is that concerned about whether it would charge as homicide or not. Um, but I, I don't, without the law faculty, I'm reluctant to make a, a strong stand on that activity. All right, thanks very much.